the world that you and I are operating in right now, like this conscious waking world of tangible physical objects that you can touch and feel and weigh, is like a thin sliver of veneer that we're existing in. We're existing in this thin sliver of space and we're connected to this thing that we can experience under normal conscious states. And this thing is constantly being affected and changed by what's happening in this thin sliver of veneer. So all the thoughts that you have, all the behavior that you exhibit, all the actions that you take, all of those things that exist in this thin veneer is affecting all of this that's going on in eternity. That there's this infinite space of whatever these things are, whether they're souls or interdimensional creatures or beings, but that the way you interact with other people has a direct effect on that world and that world has a direct effect on the way you interact with people right. and that you have to develop some sort of harmony and I think that people struggle to do that throughout history and that's one of the reasons why religion is so it's so common it's not just common it's amongst all tribes they've always had a belief almost all of them, almost all major civilizations have had a belief in something larger than themselves. And whether it's gods or whether it's uh, like the, the a lot of the Native Americans thought that a lot of their gods existed in nature, the gods of animals and coyotes were gods and the sun was a god. And that these there's some larger than this current experience thing that we must pay homage to, that we must give praise to, that we, 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 we must feel the divine intervention of these other realms. And it just exists in all cultures, in all societies. And I think part of that is because there's moments in time where you recognize. And you could have these moments in time, whether it's the birth of a child, whether it's true love, whether it's uh, just the bonding between friends in an incredible moment in life where you feel like you get up just a chance for a second to peek your head through the clouds. There's something more. Yeah, and see that there's something more and that you're somehow or another connected to this. But our monkey bodies will not allow us to see it because to survive, you can't li really live in that realm. For most of human history, if you wanted to survive, you had to be a barbarian. You yeah. had to be savage. You had to have knives and tools and you have to be able to fight off predators and warring tribes that want to invade you there was you couldn't live in the spiritual realm until they figured out how to stockpile ammunition and food and develop walls exactly and then they started tripping balls <laughs> right <laughs> he's not wrong or should i say he's very far from being entirely wrong given what we know in physics now i do not wish to push this comparison too far and i'm the first to balk at linking the mystical to the scientific and the best of our physical explanations. But it is entirely true to say that what we see, observe and experience is but a tiny sliver or the thinnest film on the surface of the really existing multiverse, which stretches back billions of years, perhaps further, and off into an infinite future. But forget that, because right now there are universes simultaneously existing here and now, identical, fungible copies of this universe. To what extent fungible copies of you are you, we are yet to fully explain. Perhaps they are identically you, and consciousness really is consciousness of those multiple entities simultaneously until they differentiate into copies, which are now doing different things. And so now also consists of many, many copies of you doing something slightly different and some things wildly different. But are those differences as strange as worlds where magic works, for example? No, as David Deutsch explains in chapter 11 of The Beginning of Infinity, the multiverse chapter, only where magic appears to have worked until now. In other words, by extreme coincidence, each time a bespeckled boy lifts a wooden stick and shouts some magic words, sparks of lightning are emitted from the tip of that stick. All by coincidence, however, and not because the words or the stick cause the lightning. And in those universes where that has happened, it should always be expected that next time he tries to do it, 
it will fail. And it will continue to fail so that the proportion of universes where it continues to happen continues to vanish ever further and closer to zero, to a thinner and thinner sliver among all the universes of the multiverse. We, who follow in the Everett tradition, tend to call these universes Harry Potter universes. And at the end of this video, I'm going to provide a short clip with some brief excerpts from my discussion of the beginning of infinity about precisely that. But the thing is, we always occupy the thin sliver, as Joe referred to it there. The multiverse is vast, vast beyond our capacity to visualize, but not to comprehend entirely. Quantum physics does not cash out any mystical claims, but it can cash out this idea that reality is so much more than we observe, or even than we can observe. It is absolutely true, as Joe says, that we exist in a thin sliver of space. Now, whether this has anything to do whatsoever with intelligent beings that may exist elsewhere in the multiverse, quantum theory is silent on that. It says that it is possible that physical reality evolved elsewhere differently to what it did in our timeline. That there may be simultaneous with ours, a physical reality existing of really existing people, vastly more powerful than us, we don't know. And our physical theories as we know them tend to prohibit our communicating with them, our communicating between universes vastly different from our own. But that is of course our best understanding of physical theory as it is. And we should take it seriously and not fall down into any rabbit hole of pseudoscience. But we're free to conjecture. We can conjecture all we like. Could entities that evolved in another part of the multiverse have found the successor to the successor to the successor of quantum theory? Using that theory, can they communicate under some conditions across the multiverse in ways we cannot yet imagine? We cannot know right now. We occupy only a tiny sliver and are, for now, trapped, in a sense, by our existing knowledge. But we won't be constrained by that knowledge forever. We won't be constrained in generations to come the way we are now. And this idea that all our behaviours affect what goes on in eternity should be taken seriously. We can be a beginning of infinity. And if we are, then it is true that many of our choices today will affect the course of events off into a future we cannot imagine today, for it will consist of a world inhabited by beings creating knowledge we have no hope of predicting now, for if we could predict it now, we would have that knowledge now. Maybe that world that Joe speaks of is in the future. We can have a direct effect on the future, personally and as a civilization, through the choices we make today and the knowledge we create. Into the future, as well as across the multiverse, as we come to gain more and more control of physical reality, and by understanding it to a greater and greater accuracy through our explanations. Joe gets to these ideas intuitively. But there is a concordance here with what we know about quantum theory already. I hasten to add once more that grandiose claims have often been made by invoking quantum theory in order to cash out some of the more wild claims in certain mystical traditions. I do not wish to do that. Joe himself is not making strong claims either, but it should be reasonable to say he's not wrong. Whether he is entirely right or not is another thing altogether, but then quantum theory cannot be entirely right or the final word either. All we know is that we both agree on this. What we see and experience is merely the thin veneer on an ocean of reality that physics tells us is the largest structure ever explained as really existing by science. And the complexity of that structure and what exists in that structure in some ultimate sense could be beyond what anyone right now is even capable of imagining. And you could have these moments in time, whether it's the birth of a child, whether it's true love, whether it's just the bonding between friends in an incredible moment in life where you feel like you get up just a chance for a second to peek your head through the clouds. There's something more. This peek through the clouds, this seeing something more, it can come from all those things Joe says, and it can come from science too. Especially taking science a little more seriously as an explanation of the reality we cannot see and we cannot hope to see. 
Our brains forget our monkey bodies, but our brains run minds that are universal and completely different to any monkey in their ability to explain all this. We cannot explain everything right now in practice, and there will always be an infinite amount more left to explain, but these special minds of ours do allow us to glimpse the underlying reality, however imperfectly, and it is science that refines and brings into focus what is really there. Now that we've largely solved the problem of surviving, we can turn to using these minds for more than just finding food, water and shelter. We can begin more deeply understanding everything and constructing physical reality around us so that we can see more and more of it and so that more and more of it becomes a genuine part of our home. We no longer have to be barbarians. We are universal constructors and explainers whose capacity to create knowledge reaches out from here into every part of reality. And the more we create that knowledge, the more we'll know how to create, transform and command ever faster and ever more reliably the rest of the multiverse. I'm skipping a bit and I'm skipping to a large part about what I would still call um, Harry Potter universes where David is talking about boiling some water for example and yes and this is what in the last episode Brett Weinstein was very concerned about that sometimes these highly unlikely events indeed happen you know, for example if you're boiling water David writes in some tiny sliver of the multiverse the kettle transforms itself into a top hat and the water into a rabbit, which then hops away. And you get neither, neither tea nor coffee, but rather a very surprise. That is a history after that transformation, but there is no way of correctly explaining what was happening during it or predicting the probabilities without referring to other parts of the multiverse, enormously larger parts with larger measures in which there was no rabbit, yes. And so uh, there's no reason to reject <laughs> the multiverse just because there's this tiny, tiny sliver of universes in which some bizarre things happen. And what David writes about this, okay, so where we have a situation where you're boiling water to make tea. Throughout your entire life, of course, every time you boil water to make tea, um, one would expect nothing particularly unusual happens. But David does say, that, well, it's consistent with the laws of physics. It's quite possible for the kettle to turn itself into a top hat and the water to turn itself into a rabbit, which again hops away. So we've got these kind of two versions, the one in which you boil water, nothing unusual happens and you make tea, and one in which you end up with the rabbit. On that, David says, and so I'm skipping a, a huge amount here from this chapter, from the beginning of infinity, but I'll just concentrate on the section where he says, quote, the rabbit history is fundamentally different from the tea history, in that the latter, the tea history, remains very accurately autonomous throughout the period. In the rabbit history, I end up with memories that are identical to what they would be in a history in which water became a rabbit. But those are misleading memories. There was no such history. The history containing those memories began only after the rabbit had formed. For that matter, there are also places in the multiverse, of far larger measure than that one, in which only my brain was affected, producing exactly those memories. In effect, I had an hallucination caused by random motion of the atoms in my brain. Pause there, my reflection. So just to emphasize this bit. Yes, it's possible that indeed a kettle can form itself into a top hat and water can form itself into a rabbit, such that boiling tea, boiling water for tea, leads to this rabbit jumping out of a top hat. But as David says there, not only is that exceedingly unlikely, the tiny, tiny measure of universe in which that happens, but, if you actually did have that memory, if you actually, if that seemed to have occurred to you, the better explanation, according to quantum theory, is that that occurred only in your brain. That there was misfirings of neurons in your brain that caused you to hallucinate that exact thing, rather than that exact thing actually happening, okay? So quantum theory makes sense out of those things. And David writes straight after that, some philosophers make a big issue of that sort of thing, claiming that it casts doubt on the scientific status of quantum theory. But of course, they are empiricists. In reality, misleading observations, misleading memories and false interpretations are common even in the mainstreams of history. 
we have to work hard to avoid fooling ourselves with them. So it is not quite true that, for instance, there are histories in which magic appears to work. There are only histories in which magic appears to have worked, but will never work again. There are histories in which I appear to have walked through a wall because all the atoms of my body happened to resume their original courses after being deflected by atoms in the wall. But those histories began at the wall. The true explanation of what happened involves many other instances of me and it, or we can roughly explain it in terms of random events of very low probability. It is a bit like winning a lottery. The winner cannot properly explain what has just happened without invoking the existence of many losers. In the multiverse, the losers are the other instances of oneself.